Um, welcome, bonjour. I'm Kathy Wing. I'm the co-executive director of the Media Awareness Network, and I'm pleased to welcome you here today for this panel discussion on uh, how digital media is impacting on the journalism profession and uh, the news industry in general. Uh, this event today marks the uh, launch of the fourth annual Media Literacy Week in Canada, and that's an initiative of the Canadian Teachers Federation and our organization, the Media Awareness Network. Our organizations came together four years ago to launch this event because we really believe that me, uh, critical thinking skills about media are crucial in the complex media landscape that we live in today. And that's particularly true of young people who are the most active users of media, of course. I have a few thank yous that I need to extend before we get started um, to people and organizations and sponsors who, without their support, this initiative would not take place. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, Historica Dominion Institute's Encounters with Canada, which is a, a youth program that brings together young people from all regions of Canada um, for a week of activities in Ottawa related to interests that they have. So with us today is a group of young people who are thinking of pursuing careers in journalism and communications. Um, so I, I really hope that today they'll hear something from today's panelists that will give them real food for thought and, um, and some direction as they contemplate a future uh, in these professions. I'd like to thank our Media Literacy Week sponsors who provide the critical funding necessary uh, for this initiative to take place. This year we welcome YouTube as our gold sponsor. Bell and the Entertainment Software Association of Canada are silver sponsors, and uh, the Government of Canada as well. And Open Text and the Newfoundland and Labrador Teachers Association are our bronze sponsors. And also thank you to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, who's our venue sponsor for today. Thank you all our sponsors for their really critical support. I also wish to thank the 37 collaborating organizations and countless individuals who are planning events throughout this week all across Canada. Um, and I'm now going to turn the podium over to uh, Mary Lou Donnelly, the president of the Canadian Teachers Federation. The CTF has been a wonderful partner in this initiative, and we thank them for their support. Please welcome Mary Lou. Thank you very much, Kathy. I, I have to say I'm really excited to be here, and more importantly, I'm so excited to see the number of students that we have here to, uh, to launch Media Literacy Week with us. Your enthusiasm and the energy that I feel in the room um, certainly puts me right back in the classroom where, um, where it wasn't too long ago where I was. And I have to tell you, and I know that the teachers in the room will agree with me, that it's one of the most exciting places to be, and this is the reason why. So thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate that. Et Cathy, merci beaucoup. J'aimerais féliciter toi et ton équipe au réseau Éducation Média pour tout le beau travail que vous accomplissez à l'intention des élèves, des parents et du, person et du, et du personnel enseignant au Canada. Canadian Teachers Federation is once again so delighted to be able to partner with the Media Awareness Network for this year's Media Literacy Week. We're also very pleased to partner with Historica Dominion Institute and to have all of you here in the audience as Canada's future communicators and journalists. When the Media Awareness Network and the Canadian Teachers Federation launched the very first Media Literacy Week in 2006, many of the social networking tools we know today didn't even exist then. And I have to tell you, I had difficulty even pronouncing some of them. I know it's your first language, you can do that very well. Twitters, Nings, blogs, MSN, M SMS, MSN's an old one, isn't it? Pins, wikis, and others are changing the way the world communicates. These tools allow you to share ideas and opinions with your personal friends, as well as those you know online, no matter where their location is. They also have an impact on the way information and the news are presented to us, and I really look forward to hearing what our panelists have to say about how media has changed the face of news gathering. Les membres du personnel enseignant ont un important rôle à jouer pour ceux qui aient d'aider les jeunes à s'y retrouver parmi la multitude des connaissances médiatiques et numériques qu'ils ont la possibilité d'acquérir. Students are not simply users but creators of media. 
And as teachers, we must nur nurture this creativity while helping you, the students, become engaged and responsible e-citizens. And as a teacher organization, we feel it is both our duty and social responsibility to be supportive in ways to give young Canadians the best that the world of media can offer. And that is why we firmly believe that media and digital literacy are life skills that should be included in the curriculum along with traditional literacy and numeracy skills. Thank you for celebrating Media Literacy Week with us today. I look forward to hearing your questions from the panel. For the panel, un grand merci de votre participation. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Mary Lou, and we commend the Canadian Teachers Federation for their immense contribution to media literacy in Canada. Uh, in addition to education and community sectors, governments and industry can also play an important role by supporting media literacy initiatives. Uh, Google is a great example of how the private sector can get involved under its YouTube banner. They're the goal sponsor of uh, this, this year's Media Literacy Week. And with us today representing Google is Jacob Glick, Canada Policy Council and a board member of the Media Awareness Network. Please welcome Jacob. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Google and YouTube uh, are delighted to be uh, sponsors of Media Literacy Week um, and to be participants with the Media Awareness Network. I myself am just happy to be counted among the adults, um, but you clearly didn't do it based on maturity level, so I thank you for not uh, looking at that uh, too closely. Um, in my pocket, I have one of these. You probably have something similar in your pocket. With a cell phone and a camera, all of us have the basic tools for communications in today's ever-pervasive media environment. And with platforms for communication, we can find global audiences for our ideas and our messages. But of course, with the power to uh, communicate those ideas uh, comes the necessity to understand how to parse all the, the panoply of information, that barrage of information that comes at us. Uh, that's why media literacy is such a critical component of citizenship, both digital citizenship and physical citizenship, and a critical component for Canada's competitiveness and digital agenda. And uh, in that regard, we're delighted to participate and to sponsor Media Literacy Week with uh, such wonderful partners and with a, such a tremendous organization as the Media Awareness Network. So thank you very much. So at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce you to our moderator today. We are thrilled to have Danielle Bouchard. Uh, Danielle is the weekend uh, TV news anchor at Radio Canada <coughs> Sorry, in uh, Ottawa Gatineau. And he was busy covering the uh, municipal election last night, so he's had a busy 24 hours. Uh, he's the TV... Um, He's also a communications professor at Ottawa University. Previously, he was a broadcast journalist and producer. Danielle has his PhD in history with a concentration on Canadian studies from the University of Ottawa, a master's degree from Laurentian University, and a bachelor's degree in communication from the uh, University of Laval. Thank you, Danielle. Merci beaucoup. Bienvenue tout le monde. Welcome everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today to hear these uh, interesting, knowledgeable people. I'm very impressed with the panel. I'm very impressed with the turnout also when I see all these students coming here to learn and I hope to ask questions also. I would recommend that, uh, that you would start to ask your question because we have less than an hour. So if you want to be sure that you'll get an answer, you should start now to ask your question. What I like also to say is that uh, we're going to hear lots about technology in the, in the next few minutes, but behind these technology change, there's human being. Not long time ago, we were seeing that media would set the agenda for people. 
they will not tell them what to think, but they will tell them what to think about. And now it has completely changed. It's the people that will set the agenda. So you don't wait to learn what the media will tell you at 6 o'clock, at 10 o'clock at night. You will be able to go 24 hours, internet, uh, media, radio, television, and to uh, ask what you want to know about. Alors, je vais commencer tout de suite à vous présenter nos quatre panélistes, en commençant par mon, ma gauche, l'extrémité, donc avec Altia Raj, elle est du National Bureau uh, Sun Media. Altia Raj joined Sun Media National Bureau as reporter in February 2009. She previously worked as a Chase and Live producer for CTV News, Parliament's Bureau, and an associate producer with CBC's national radios, The House. She started a journalism career with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in Montreal. She has worked for the National, CBC News at 6, Ottawa Morning, All in a Day, and CBC Radio in Ottawa. Elle a été stagiaire du programme de stage Peter Zalski de la radio de la CBC, du programme de stage parlementaire et de la mission du Canada auprès des Nations Unies à New York. Madame Raj est titulaire de baccalauréat en art avec double spécialisation de l'Université McGill. Elle est également rédactrice en chef et fondatrice du blog Apartment 613, uh, apartment613.ca. Alors, je vous invite à accueillir Madame Altia Raj. Peut-être y aller avec votre présentation. Well, I was asked what news gathering in the digital age means to me. And as a newbie reporter, um, I really only started working for Penny in February. I think I may not be the best person to uh, say how things have changed, but I'll tell you a little bit about my daily work. I think simply news gathering in the digital age means that reporters are being asked to do a lot more. We are tweeting, we're blogging, we're live blogging, we're shooting videos, uh, self-contained videos, not just uh, look lives, as you wish. We're writing for the web, we're writing for papers, we have a very uh, web-first mentality. Um, it's also meant that newspaper reporters are becoming wire reporters. Uh, wire reporters, I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but that's sort of like the Canadian press, in the sense that we go to a news conference, uh, we usually have a tip-off of what the conference is about. We may have already written most of our story, we add a few quotes, we send it to the web. After the press conference is over, we go back to work, we add in a few opposition critics, a few other voices. We shoot that off to the web. Throughout the day, you're just adding to your story until uh, about six o'clock, and that story is the one that goes in the paper. You might do this two or three times a day, so you're actually filing way more than one story. Um, I know for my colleagues, a big change is that uh, web first mentality means that you are breaking stories for the web. You're not just breaking stories in that morning newspaper, and that's uh, a big change. But that's both my pay scale, so I won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> I think in terms of challenges, it's really difficult to do everything well. Um, I'm, as she is the cameraman, I'm not going to be uh, the best camera person with three hours of training and the opportunity to do a video once a week, even once a day. Um, but uh, you know, you obviously do your best. The biggest challenge, I think, is time management. Um, when you're doing a web first mentality, you're really trying to match what everyone else is doing and hopefully outscoops them. But while you're doing agenda stories, you're not um, filing access to information requests, you're not reading access to information requests, you're not uh, connecting with sources, going on, on luncheons, trying to get your scoops out because you're trying to file three stories on, uh, you know, reacting to the day's events, let's say on President Hill. Um, so that's very difficult. Um, sometimes things change extremely rapidly and you're being asked to, uh, like, read a failure book in one day uh, file this and file two other stories. So you really have to learn to adapt um, and be very flexible because that's what employers are looking for. Um, you're probably working on much more. I'm not the best person to say that that is actually true, but uh, perhaps other people at the table will be able to talk about that. Um, I think a challenge uh, is that you're actually relying on your colleagues a lot more, um, even your competitors. So on Parliament Hill, we're pretty um, a lucky group. We have the support of uh, full-time staff members at the press gallery who will record press conferences. So you can actually cover three press conferences in a day, even if they happen all at the same time. But you're relying on reporters who are in the room to ask the right questions, to listen, to ask the right follow-up questions, because you're not there. 
Um, same thing happens when you're in a scrum. Say, after a question period, when ministers and uh, opposition critics come out, if you're shooting video, you can't necessarily hear what they're saying. You're, uh, you know, shooting from 30, 40 feet away. You're shooting uh, mid close-ups. You're changing your angle. Um, you're not there asking the questions that you might need to ask for your story. So you're really relying on other people to help you do your own job. Maybe I'll ask you to have your closing remarks because you're going to have the chance when there's going to be a few questions maybe to go further. Okay. Uh, just wanted to talk about uh, opportunities, I guess. Um, you get to do things that you would not normally get to do. Um, I put that up on the screen. I was at the G20 covering, well, I was in Pittsburgh covering the G20. Um, and uh, a sidebar was that uh, the embassy staff was really concerned that the Prime Minister didn't have a table on which to put his drinking glass. So they found a garbage can and dressed it up for a tablecloth. Now that sort of stuff is fun. It's behind the scenes stuff and makes people feel like they're there. But that never obviously go in your story. So there are opportunities and, and fun stuff that digital media allows you to do. I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Maintenant, Roger Dubois, que je connais très bien parce que j'ai l'honneur de travailler avec Roger et de voir jusqu'à quel point il a contribué de par sa façon de faire à améliorer le métier de journaliste. As the mobile cameraman for the CBC in Ottawa, Roger is responsible for capturing major national events such as the opening sessions of Parliament and visits of international dignitaries. He also worked for the local CBC News as well as television programs such as On the Rogue Again and Hockey Night in Canada. Since 1997, Roger's work has evolved and he is now video journalist for CBC News at 6 in Ottawa as well as for cbc.ca. Les séquences vidéo et le travail de M. Dubois alimentent les bulletins de nouvelles de Radio-Canada et de la CBC, le réseau anglais de Radio-Canada. Parfaitement bilingue, Roger Dubois a obtenu un diplôme en radio-télédiffusion du Collège Algonquin en 1977. Il est originaire du nord du Québec et travaille à Radio-Canada depuis 32 ans. Je vous invite à l'accueillir comme il se doit. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll speak in English for now, but when you have questions, you can ask them and I'll enter in French if it's okay with you. And uh, like my colleague said, uh, I've been employed in the TV business for 32 years. And the only reason why I'm saying that is because I want to bring you back on a little trip uh, just to see, to show you uh, the change that happened in 30 years. Uh, when I started, everything was shot on film. Uh, and you had to be done by 3.30, that was it, that was all. So uh, you had to plan your shoot very well because uh, at 3.30 you had to go to the lab, bring, develop the film, bring it back, splice it at 5 o'clock, that was the, the limit, and after it was cut together, put together with tapes and uh, uh, blades actually, it was cut with blades, and that was your report for the night. So you had to plan your shoot very well. You had to know your question in advance uh, because you had about 400 to 600 footage of film. And that was for the whole thing, for your visuals, your interviews, your sequences and everything. So uh, there's no room for errors and you, you plan your shoot before you plan your question. You had five questions, that was it. Now you can go 60 minutes with a videotape on one person, use 30 seconds and that what will go on there. Uh, back then, as a journalist going out on a story with a camera, you had to finish shooting uh, and make sure that the whole thing was developed and no problem because after that, uh, I work in Telecine where I took these films, put it on air, and if you something broke, well, there was no news of that story during the night. And I was putting, uh, just to show you, uh, I was putting uh, Star Trek on TV on Sunday morning and Coronation Street. And the reels were that big that they picked three of them. And you had to put them one after the other one, not three, two, and one, or one, three, and two, because then the viewer will be a bit lost in it. Today, you will get your cell phone or Blackberry, take a picture or moving video and send it to the newsroom. YouTube, blog it or Twitter it, and voila, you instantly created a media report. So a lot of people can be journalists for a moment, but is that what all it takes? Some of those uh, short clips make it around the world in an instant. As fast as you hit the send button your cell phone, on your cell phone. 
The only problem with that is sometimes you go too fast. Uh, we had a uh, balloon boy last uh, two weeks ago that was traveling in a, in a balloon. While well, everybody was riveted to their TV for at least half hour to an hour to find out after it was not exact. And then we found more. Uh, as reporters started working on the story, we found out it was a hoax. But everybody was riveted for an hour in front of their TV. Uh, it is extremely important to be concise with all the elements of information for a future report to develop it into a co coherent and easy to understand news story. And that's what will be your role. Uh, so to become a journalist or to work in the media for a salary or a paycheck, because I think that's what people want also, not just for the fun of it, uh, the tools that schools, colleges, or university will give you are still the only way to go. Peut-être quelques mots de conclusion. On aura la chance de revenir, Roger. Just my uh, transition from camera person to video journalist was very smooth, thanks to CBC. They put together a five-week course to be able to teach a camera person how to treat the information and teach journalists how to use the camera. Two senior world correspondents with plenty of university degrees were the teachers. And uh, it was an extreme course that I would not recommend to everybody, but it worked. And now uh, you have so many ways to watch what is going on in the world today, and it could be one of you feeding the news and uh, information to the world. So I hope your question will ask us how to do it. Merci beaucoup, Roger Dubois. Now, let me introduce you to Scott Rubin from Google Global Communications and Public Affairs. Scott Rubin is the head of policy communication at YouTube and manages Google's public policy efforts on child safety. He also oversees Google's communications for various issues, including freedom of expression and Internet censorship. Prior to joining Google, he was the Director of Communication and Senior Research Associate at the Institute for Jewish and Community Research and an independent think tank. Plus tôt dans sa carrière, il a été pendant 15 ans à la tête de ProNod Communications, une entreprise de communication interculturelle. Il détient un baccalauréat en littérature de l'Université Harvard et une maîtrise de l'Université John Hopkins. Accueillons comme il se doit, M. Scott Rubin. Uh, first of all, thank you for welcoming me, me to Canada. I think I'm the, the only American on the panel. Um, I'm happy to have come across the border. Um, I come to this, we come to this from the other side, listening to my two panelists here, thinking about what Althea said about not being the best camera person and the 32 years that Roger spent in, in the business, we're not a news organization. And yet, in both of your comments, and I would imagine a lot of the questions, YouTube and Google will come up. Um, YouTube is an extremely popular destination for sharing of videos. And that means everything from hamsters on pianos to very serious news stories that are breaking on YouTube. So what does that mean for you? What does it mean as you contemplate your future? I deal with reporters every day in my job. Um, as a person, so if you're thinking about going into communications, I'm the person that, that would be talking to you if you're reporters, or you'd be, talking, you'd be doing my job if you want to talk to reporters. And our worlds are blending more and more all the time. Um, so for us, our job is to create a platform for free expression, for the democratization of information, and, and that may mean that some of the formal work that you do or some of the informal work that you do might also be joined by stuff that my next door neighbor might do with the cell phone, with a flip cam, with your own video recorder, and it goes up onto YouTube and there's a conversation that ensues. So I wanted to share with you just a couple of examples of um, critical moments in the history of YouTube related to free expression, related to journalism, related to the changing concept of information sharing in the world that takes place on an open platform. And I think it's also essential to, to recognize that we have baked into YouTube and to Google, but especially onto YouTube in this context, these principles of free expression and open access to information. Uh, without it, a lot of the things that I'm about to show you would never have, uh, would never have appeared on YouTube. So, uh, let's just start in 2007, and I'll, I'll be brief with these examples, and there won't be, by the way, I don't think you'll hear the audio, but it doesn't really matter. In um, May of 2007, um, in, in Myanmar, in Burma, 
the monks in Burma decided to protest against the repressive government there. And the response, as happens often, we see this all the time at Google and YouTube, the response of the government was to shut down journalists. Foreign journalists were expelled, all forms of media communication were cut off, cell phones were cut off. And instead, what, what the citizens of Burma did, of Myanmar did, they took videos on their cell phones, on their flip cams, and they went to the border with Thailand. And they grabbed signal from across the border, and they broadcast videos. So here's just a quick example of what we saw. seems like a simple view of people marching down the street, but as a result of these videos, citizen journalists going out there documenting what professional journalists were not allowed to do, the BBC, the CDC, uh, all the major networks in the U.S., really across the world picked this up, and the pressure on the government increased to the point that they stopped repressing these monks during these protests. A little bit later, same year, uh, Venezuela, uh, Hugo Chavez, decided that RCTV, Radio Caracas Television, um, which had participated in, they broadcast some um, fair and balanced approaches and criticism of the government, so he withdrew their license to broadcast, shut them down entirely, and that day they opened a channel on YouTube, and they began their daily newscast directly from YouTube. So this is just a newscast from RCTV. Within a short time, they had nearly a million views on this, and there was no way that Hugo Chavez could block them. So this is another place where professional journalists are cutting across, democratizing information. Finally, the last one I'll, I'll, I'll share with you now, and probably the most famous, um, I don't know if, if everyone is familiar with what happened in Iran following the, the recent elections there, but um, journalists, foreign journalists lost their credentials. Um, most forms of media were cut off. We saw at YouTube traffic in Iran dropped uh, to 10% of its normal values. And yet, videos were snuck out of the country. Uh, people sent them, used circumvention technology mm -hmm. to get around the blocks. And the most famous video um, was of a young woman named Nader Sultani. And the video I'm about to show you um, is brutal. Um, it, is a, it, is, it was taken on a uh, camera by a person on the street this is the video that changed the tide of uh, public opinion, of the way the people in Iran started to gather around it. So I want to warn you before you watch it, if you don't want to see something that's it's fairly violent, this is the death of a young woman who was shot on the streets, and we struggled at YouTube with what to do with this video. Although we're a platform for free expression, we have certain rules, and generally we don't allow graphic violence. But if it has educational or documentary value, we will make an exception. And in this case, this video was so important that we allowed it to go up on the site. So if you feel at all speech about this, this is the time to look away. Um, it's just a couple of seconds, but it's such a critical video. So I'll stop there. So she died on a camera, and she's been called now the angel of Iran. She's become the rallying point for the people who are opposing the uh, results of the election there. Mm -hmm. The other side of this, though, is now, and we're still blocked in Iran. We're still seeing only 10% of our traffic. But now the Iranian government, the, the anecdotes that I'm hearing is that they're using the videos that people posted on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And there were thousands and thousands and thousands of videos of the protests in Iran. They're using them now to identify faces of people who are protesting and using these as a form of, of reprisal. Mr. Rubin, can we stop there? And uh, I guess we're going to go further when, because we have lots of questions already and uh, there's only uh, 25 minutes left. Let's introduce our next, uh, thank you. Let's our, uh, introduce our next guest. Mr. Andrew Cohen is an award winning journalist, best selling author, and professor of journalism and international affairs at Carleton University. In his career of 30 years, he has worked at home and abroad from the Ottawa Citizen, United Press International, Time, The Financial Post, Saturday Night and the Globe and Mail, where he was a member of editorial board, a columnist and foreign correspondent in Washington. 
Il a remporté deux fois le concours canadien de journalisme. s'est mérité trois fois un prix du National Magazine ainsi que la médaille du Jubilé de la Reine Elisabeth. Il a écrit et collaboré à cinq ouvrages, dont The Unfinished Canadian, The People We Are, et While Canada Slept, How We Lost Our Place in the World, qui a été un succès de librairie au Canada et a aussi été finaliste du prix du gouverneur général dans la catégorie « Études et essais ». Son livre le plus récent s'intitule « Extraordinary Canadians, Lester B. Pearson ». Let's welcome Andrew Cohen. Uh, thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here. As I listen to my, panel, my uh, co-panelists here, I, I think you have a, a conversation I had um, with my um, editor. I write a column for the Town West uh, papers, and um, my editor was saying to me, he's 15 years younger than I am, about a half a generation, and he said to me, he said, You'll, uh, I, I've been in this business a while, and he less so, and he said to me, um, you'll get to finish your career writing a column. You'll get to finish your career in the old me. He said, I probably won't. And um, we both thought about that, and he's probably right. And as I, I listen to others here, I think of the pace of change <coughs> in the media since I entered it. Um, like, um, like others, like uh, Roger, I think you said 32 years, it is about the same for me. <coughs> um, it has been a, a while, and when I entered, things, of course, were entirely different. Not only was there no internet, there were virtually no computers. Um, I remember when I entered the, the newsroom of the paper I was at, um, uh, computers had just arrived. There was what were called smart and dumb systems, and they mainly seemed dumb. Um, they seemed unable to do a lot, and no one quite understand. And we had begun, actually, uh, with typewriters and cutting and pasting. It seemed like you know the dark ages compared to today. Of course, the internet arrived, and things have, have changed. And, and I think that most of us have welcomed that change. I'm not of the Luddite school, which thinks, and there are people of, uh, older than I am who have resisted at every uh, stage the changes. I think they've been great. When I see the kind of thing that the Internet can do as, a, as an instrument of democracy in the world, having covered uh, Burma and other places, I think it's extraordinary as an instrument um, of freedom. Um, my concerns, though, are what has really changed. And as I listen to Altia, I thought of myself, she's doing, in a sense, what I was doing in a different way uh, about 20 years ago. When you used the word wire service supporter, you're doing what we were doing. Um, we were running around. Um, I worked on Parliament Hill, as you do now. I was with uh, United Press International. We were facing the competition, which was Canadian Press. The press gallery was very big. We ran from one news conference to another, trying to make sense of what was happening in Ottawa. We would, there were, um, and still are, um, gatherings called scrums outside the court of the House of Commons in which a minister would talk to reporters. I assume they still happen, or maybe they don't the same way. We didn't even know who was talking. We just would shove a, 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 um, a tape recorder, and if you had a new tape recorder, it was the Sony something something model, and hope that we could, you know, determine later who was speaking. We would go back to our offices and file three stories to the wire in the next 90 minutes. If there were over 300 words, and we always hoped they would be, you got a byline in the paper next day, and so you wanted 300 words. But what I'm saying is that uh, I had doubts about that then, and I have doubts about it now, and mine would be the voice here of caution. I worry about the content. I worry about what is going on the internet. I worry about, and I don't mean necessarily YouTube or Google. I mean in the blogosphere. I mean the, the opportunity for distortion. I would, uh, the opportunity for misleading information. And I would have a few caveats which I would hope you would consider here. One is security and privacy. What's going on there and what are you people putting on there? And I have a 14 year old who's on Facebook all the time and I really worry what is on there. He's actually now cut both his parents out so we can barely see what he's got. But um, I worry about that. I worry about accuracy. I worry about authenticity and originality. And I hope that you do too. Because what is on there in many ways is dangerous. I'll give you a small example. Being of the old media, so to speak, my wife and I, my, we both were at the Globe Mail for many years. Uh, and to a degree, we still write for them, uh, write for the Globe. Uh, we were in Germany, we were living in Berlin. My wife wrote what would have been called in the old days a long feature story um, on uh, a, a German Jew who had been on one of the last Kinder transports in 1938. In, in other words, one of the, one of the, the kids, German uh, Jewish kids, that the Nazis allowed to leave in 1938, just after Kristallnacht. He came back 60 years after, 50 years after, and talked about his life um, and leaving. And my wife wrote a long and I thought excellent piece of journalism which ran in the Globe and Mail 
on what it was like for him to return to Germany years after he had been expelled and had found life, um, had been had survived the war. We were amazed to see it. It was posted, uh, because of course everything is electronic, and we weren't used to the blogosphere. We had been living in Germany. It doesn't not that it didn't exist there, but we just weren't used to the how things work. Well, we found a string. We went on onto it on a Saturday. Normally, it would come out. That would be it, be it in the paper, and there might be letters to the editor the next week. All of which would be vetted, vetted for accuracy and vetted for taste and perhaps opinion. What we saw what on were responses from readers, um, which were essentially unfiltered. And I leave that word with you: unfiltered, meaning nobody between it and the internet. And what was it? It was. I wouldn't call it. Um, the worst kind of anti-Semitism or racism, but it was pretty close. And we were amazed the Globe had allowed it. The Globe, the paper that we had trained at, the best paper in Canada, the paper of record in Canada, had allowed that to happen. Maybe it was a weekend editor, but somehow that had got on the internet. That would never have been in the paper before. What, what does it mean to you? It was an example, I think, of what can go on the internet when nobody is paying attention. And we were trained journalists of years ago, and to this day I'm at a school of journalism, where we try and train. Um, we try and um, uh, run students to the kinds of exercises and, the mm -hmm. and give them the kind of background they need. I'm, I'm to <laughs> I can see you're getting nervous. Uh, but we try and, and we can talk about this, but there is a, still a reason for journalism school and there's a reason for the practices and the rules and the regimen there because we hope it sends out journalists into the world who know what they're doing because much of what is on the internet today the so-called citizen journalists have no training at all, and there are no standards, and it leads to misinformation and worse than that. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. I think we should applaud our panel because that was very, very interesting. Now, I know they have a lot more to say. I know that we have some questions here. In the room, you can go to the microphone if you want to ask a question. And wherever you are in Canada, through this uh, webcast system, you can ask questions also. So I'll go quickly because there's only 20 minutes left, and I think it's important. This is the whole idea. It's interaction. So I'll go with the uh, question. Like I said, you can go to the microphone in, in a room. But I'll start with Scott Rubin. There is a question here, and it's a very good question. Do you ever face pressure from the government to censor, remove videos or information from YouTube or Google? It's a, it's a great question and one I get many times a week. Um, and the simple answer is no. Um, we don't. We we have community guidelines at YouTube that determine what is allowed and not allowed on the site. Um, we don't bow to particular pressure if it's an unpopular point of view. And in some ways I wanted to disagree um, with the idea that the internet is a dangerous place. The more information that is out there, the more power it gives you to make choices about what is right and not right, and that's what we try to work on at, and what we try to provide our users at YouTube and Google. So we do we don't pre-screen content. 20 hours of video are uploaded every single minute to YouTube. So just digest that for a second. 20 hours of video, which means that there's a lot of misinformation. Absolutely a lot of misinformation, but a lot of opportunity to respond to that. We don't pre-screen it. Um, if governments try to pressure us to take something down, we don't do it, which means that since 2007, we've been blocked in 12 countries um, because we have, we have videos up on the site that are unpopular with certain governments. You can, I think, be happy to talk to you more about that offline. So, yeah. I'll uh, give the uh, possibility to answer to the other member of the panels, and Mr. Cohen, maybe you have something to say about that? Well, um, I, would, I, I would disagree with Scott. And, and by the way, it's no reflection of Google, which I think is a wonderful organization, which was blocked in China, if I recall, right? YouTube is currently blocked. YouTube, all right. Um, I would say that simply because there's a proliferation of information doesn't necessarily mean the consumers, the producers of that information, are any more accurate or, 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 or knowledgeable. Um, We've talked mainly about producers of information, but you're consumers of information too. What are you looking for? How do you bring a certain uh, standard of judgment? Um, the fact that there may be, or the reality that there may be lots on the internet, doesn't mean that it's all accurate. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you will have the tools with which to make that judgment. And that would be my worry. And it's not in any way to show less respect for those consuming, but it's asking them if simply they're able to make that distinction. There's a lot of. Um, pretty ugly stuff on the, on the internet. Um, there's racist stuff, there's uh, inaccurate stuff, um, 
I didn't even like my students, and you would have a response to this, I didn't like them using Wikipedia uh, as their sole source of, um, of uh, reference. I said, you can begin with Wikipedia, but don't end there. Well, too many ended there and never went to something called a book. But still, it's old news, perhaps, but a book may have things in it that Wikipedia doesn't. So I would just, I'm a, I'm a voice of caution. I don't embrace the new technology entirely without reservation. I'd like to hear Mr. Dubois and Altiel about that. What do you think, and it's the second question, what do you feel is the most dangerous aspect of displaying videos on the internet? I know for you, Roger, it's a kind of competition. What do you, how do you see it? A good way or a bad way? I think it, it is a good way because uh, people uh, will judge of their own. I mean, everybody has a good mind, and I think it, it is good to be shown, and then you make your mind about what you want to do with it as a tool. Uh, to me, the internet is a tool to put it out there, but it still needs to be processed properly with guidelines, and then it's sort of uh, digesting it and then uh, coming out with a good product that is concise. So. Uh, it's great to have it on YouTube, but somebody has to interpret it and, and concise it out. What do you think about it, Althea? Because you worked also for radio and television. I don't have a problem with YouTube videos. I don't view them as competition at all. I mean, I think more information is better than less information. I think people have a tendency to pick the information that they already agree with rather than challenge themselves. That's a problem on its own. But mm. um, I'm just a little bit confused by the answer that you gave to the question. You said, no, you don't feel any pressure, and then you said that Google, or rather YouTube, is blocked in 12 countries. So you've never faced any pressure at all? Well, we, we may face the pressure. Governments may want to do it, but we don't. We don't give that any more credence. We go to our own principles and our own guidelines, and China may disagree. We don't even know why we're blocked in China. Uh, China may disagree with the choices that we make, and that's, you know, China, the Chinese government would block us but then we don't change our policies to succumb to any pressure. How do they exercise that pressure? Um, by blocking us. <laughs> okay, they don't communicate with you? In the case of China, is a very special case. So, um, no, in China, China does its own thing, but in other countries, we're, blocked. we're currently blocked in Turkey. This is one of the better examples. There's a law in Turkey uh, that makes it illegal to criticize the founder of modern Turkey, uh, Mustafa Ataturk. And there are videos, they asked us to take down a bunch of videos. We do comply with local laws. They asked us to take down a bunch of videos. We reviewed those videos. Some of them we agreed by the local law. Some of them we thought were overbroad and were just taking down unpopular political speech. We took down the ones that violated the law to comply with local law. We left the other ones up, and their response was, shot us down. We've been shut down for a, a year and a half now. We're not going to change our policy. Um, in, uh, they would also like us to take down these videos globally so that Trump's anywhere in the world can't see the ones that we are taking. Well, I, I'm sorry, I misspoke. We didn't take them down. We IT blocked them in Turkey. So you can see them, I can see them, anywhere outside of Turkey can see them, but in Turkey they cannot be seen because they violate local law. We do not let local law um, determine what is available globally on the site. So that's a really key decision. They feel the same about their Armenian massacre. I mean, they wouldn't allow you to, to have a it's, uh, it's something that, something that um, criticizes Turkishness um, and, and is against some of their nationalist laws. They may request that we IP block them in Turkey. doesn't mean that we necessarily would. We take as narrow a view of the stuff as possible because more information is better than less information. Bon. En français, je pense qu'on peut résumer le tout en disant que finalement, il y a des aspects très positifs à tout ce que permet l'Internet, YouTube et tout ça, mais qu'il faudrait trouver une façon d'encadrer le tout pour des questions d'éthique, justement. Et à ce niveau-là, il y a une compétition qui est un peu injuste, c'est que les journalistes doivent suivre certaines règles, alors que de l'autre côté, lorsqu'on parle d'Internet, c'est libre cours à à peu près tout le monde, sauf quelques mesures qu'on peut prendre de temps à autre du côté des dirigeants. Une autre question intéressante ici, mais je vous invite, si vous avez la chance, en fait, vous avez la chance de poser une question. Uh, I invite you again to ask questions. The microphone is there. There's only a few minutes and you have experts in your field, so it's important that you can ask questions. So another question here. At a time when many news organizations are having to deal with reduced budgets, how are they being affected by effort to engage with digital media? It's an important question because some media might say, why should I pay a cameraman or a journalist when I can get it for almost free on the Internet? And I'll ask uh, maybe uh, Mr. Cohen to answer first. 
Well, actually, I'm going to defer to someone who's in the medium now rather than... Go ahead, go ahead. You would have a better well, sense of that than I do. I just want to give you a, pers a pers perspective on what I do. I'm a cameraman and a journalist. And the problem with this is having duality in your mind when you're working because the technicality of operating the camera is still high enough that you have to know what you're doing. Uh, but also, at the same time, you have to ask the right question. So your, your mind is always split in half to get the right color temperature, the sound bite, uh, sound level perfect, but also ask the intelligent what, why am I, am I here? Why am I talking to this person? And this is the big duality and it, you have to make sure that both sides are well done to, to have a good report at the end and it's, it's, a, it's hard. I think you can uh, refer to that too because you do is the question, uh, do we defer to YouTube as in part of our... Well, uh, basically what they say is uh, an employer in the media sector, would it be influenced by the fact that now you can get things for free image information and reduce their budget and hire less journalists, uh, less people? I think they want to hire less journalists. They just want us to do more with less. I mean, uh, Roger's being very modest. He's an excellent cameraman. His, his work is like pieces of art. I am not going to give you a work of art. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give you clips and some B-roll, and uh, I'll have to shoot. But the, but the question could go further. Would they accept a less quality work if they would spend less? This, this is the question. Well, I think, uh, you know, everyone wants to have great work, but they understand that you're not going to give them a 10-minute beautifully shot documentary with perfect color balance. Uh, wonderfully edited because you essentially have to do what you can with what you have. Like I, I shot a video at the G20 that I was in a high secure zone. I had to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning for security for two hours. I couldn't go outside to shoot uh, pictures of the protesters while I was inside covering Stephen Harper's press conferences. So what images did I have? I had mm. protesters in the middle of the night, so my, sh my video was very grainy. I'll, That's yeah. what... I'll tell you, Roger, I, there's no question so far in French, but I encourage you to do so. But uh, could you summarize what you said in English but in French for our listeners? Okay, mais je crois simplement que, euh, oui, euh, nous passons une s'attendent à ce qu'on leur offre un produit de quelle autre qualité, mais euh, leurs attentes, euh, je pense qu'ils sont un petit peu plus occasionnables, euh, et puis vont, ils s'attendent à ce qu'on fasse de notre mieux, essentiellement, euh, avec les ressources qu'on a. Ben, moi, je peux dire, c'est euh, la raison qui a, qu a, qu a amené ça, c'est de, de payer moins de monde pour faire la même, la même emploi. Alors, ça donnait... Euh, deux reporters au lieu d'avoir quatre personnes pour, pour couvrir la même chose. Alors, si le caméraman peut écrire l'histoire, alors ben, on, on vient d'éliminer un joueur, alors ça coûte une fortune. Euh, et maintenant, vous pouvez le faire euh, avec euh, vos, vos téléphones ou d'autres manières pour l'envoyer, mais il reste que c'est ça qui est mon point euh, le plus important, c'est d'être capable de le traiter comme il faut. Et il euh, faut prendre le temps de, de, le, de le filmer comme il faut et le temps de l'écrire comme il faut. Alors, ça prend plus de temps. Fait que la, le, ce que la compagnie a sauvé en argent, euh, tu l'as plus longtemps sur le temps, mais il essaie de réduire ça. C'est là que euh, la qualité baisse. Merci, M. Cohen. Vous voulez ajouter quelque chose? Just, uh, just a word that I, I think, uh, as I listen to both of you, and I know you both do great jobs, I think what you're being asked to do is nuts. <laughs> I really, and, and it's, it's very much what we were asked to do, and I ask you to contemplate the impact of that. If you're asked to do what you're doing, particularly to leave a press conference, to file a story, Um, to keep adding to that story, this is, this is exactly the way the wire worked. You were always adding. It was called rolling copy, particularly on a story that was breaking and urgent. Now it seems that every story is breaking and urgent because we are in the, um, we are in the feverish 24-hour uh, um, uh, news cycle. And what is the impact? Do you ever get a chance, and I would say this, and this is no commentary on you because I know you would do the best with what you do and all reporters do. But do you ever get a chance to sit back and reflect on what was said in that press conference other than simply what was said, the implications of that, to analyze it, um, to engage at least to call analytical reflective journalism? There seems to be less of that now. 
And the reason is, is that reporters are asked to, to be doing all these things and, um, and then there's very little time to do other things. And so there's a danger in this. It's, it seems to me we are so obsessed with uh, format and form that we're less interested in substance and content. And that is my word. Mm -hmm. you, uh, just one quick yeah. example. Uh, <clears throat> often when we come back from a press conference, older reporters or uh, the boss would say, what did they say? I don't know. While you were there, yeah, but I was thinking of, did I have the right filter for my camera or this? Then I'll sit down at my desk and, and know what I have to process with. But just off the cuff, like something like that, and say, what did they say? Well, uh, it's hard mm -hmm. because your, your head is full of information, and it's not just uh, uh, journalist information. It's all the things you have to deal with. Bon. Une question française ici, je vais la poser rapidement à Altia et Rosé. Euh, à titre de journaliste, quelles sont vos impressions par rapport à devoir travailler avec des reportages qui peuvent être biaisés, j'imagine que c'est venant du public en général. Qu'est-ce que, qu que ça crée chez vous, dans le fond, de voir qu'il y a de l'information sur Internet qui est souvent trompeuse, qui va à l'encontre de vos propres reportages? Moi, je pense que c'est pour ça qu'on est employé comme journaliste pour être capable de discerner et de corriger ça aussitôt qu'on le voit. Et je pense que c'est le rôle que, que vous autres allez être obligés de faire et qu'on attend que vous arriviez dans notre domaine pour le faire, parce que c'est très important. Pour avoir Merci. la bonne information. Oui. Il y a toujours l'information bien dit que ça vient, mais surtout dans mon domaine, c'est des blogs, euh, soit qui sont conservateurs ou libérales. Tout le monde essaie de discuter d'une manière ou d'une autre. Euh, c'est ta job de, de vraiment prendre l'information qui est disponible la mettre en contexte. Mm -hmm. Mais juste pour revenir au point d'Andrew, euh, je pense que, euh, oui, au moment donné, on est vraiment un transmetteur d'informations. Qu'est-ce que les gens ont dit, comment ils l'ont dit, puis qu'on essaie de sortir ça le plus vite possible. Mais après, le moment, en tout cas, moi, je retourne toujours sur, euh, sur mon thé euh, pour, pour avoir tout le contexte. Parce que des fois, quand on, quand on écrit nos morceaux, on écoute pour avoir la clé, pour avoir la station qu'on va utiliser. Puis, on n'écoute pas vraiment qu ce qui s'est passé. Des fois, on, on a manqué des bouts un petit peu plus importants. Puis ça, ça vient à, des fois, le morceau que tu vas écrire pour le, les journaux du lendemain. C'est vraiment différent de qu ce que tu as, as pas C'est très différent de qu ce que tu as écrit à une euh, Pour terminer, une dernière question. On va y aller rapidement. Peut-être, maybe one minute each, Mr. Robin and Mr. Uh, Mr. Cohen. Uh, How do you, do you see journalism and news reporting evolving in the future? One minute each, and then it's going to be it. I think it'll be I think it'll be more of the same, and it worries me. Um, it doesn't mean, and it's not to say that the wonderful tools of technology are not wonderful. They are. It depends on how they're used and what kind of judiciousness and care um, that we bring to them. Um, I have no doubt there are good people who are every bit as capable of using them as they were a generation ago. The question is, what's the time and, and um, what is the environment in which people act? Um, what are the standards? Um, is it all about speed and not about content? I mean, there was always a race in journalism to be first, but at what cost? So I would just say we should be asking ourselves those questions to try and maintain a sense of standards in a world in which they seem to be eroding. Thank you. Mr. Rubin, would you? Um, Perhaps, uh, not surprisingly, I slightly disagree with you because I'm not about this. I, I think that the standards are absolutely necessary. I think that journalism is evolving in such a way that we're, we're in a time of, if you think about it inside a cocoon, it's the metamorphosis where there's a lot of, you know, sort of sludge inside, and something is emerging, but we're not quite sure what it will be. And what's important to get back to the media awareness concept is that all of us learn how to understand our sources differently, whether you are uh, a reporter, a journalist, or somebody who's a consumer news, somebody putting up a platform, that we must have, we must be teaching this, we must be thinking about it, must be ingrained in the platforms so that they're not taken advantage of by those who would uh, pervert them and make them uh, sources of misinformation solely rather than places we can gather news and make some choices. Thank you. And we have a question from the audience. We'll take it. Hi, um, my name is Paul Kim. I'm from Surrey, British Columbia. I'm a participant with Encounters. And I am in grade 11 and in the process of determining what I should do for my future. 
and um, I have two choices as either to go into teaching or journalism. And um, I have a question about if you want to become a journalist, what are some of the requirements or specifications that are required? I can clearly, uh, clearly say that bilingualism is one aspect. And um, yeah, like what kind of education do you need? And um, another question is, what were some of the difficulties you faced as a starting journalist and some of the challenges that you're facing currently? On va, on va demander aux deux journalistes bilingues de répondre, un en français et un en anglais. Roger, peut-être une réponse en français et Altia en anglais? Uh, il reste encore que c'est les collèges et les universités qui ont le plus, le, le, les meilleures informations pour te former, pour être capable d'être journaliste. Uh, le reste, c'est des pièces d'équipement qu'il faut t'apprendre, mais euh, pour, pour euh, être capable de « process the information », ça prend euh, l'éducation. C'est la seule manière que tu peux devenir journaliste. Et les outils sont là, c'est les collèges et les universités, et après, euh, l'expérience euh, complète, euh, le trio. Alka? Um, well, Andrew mentioned after the talk that he thinks that you should go to J school. I think that you shouldn't go to journalism school. <laughs> um, I think you should get a degree in something, um, something that you like, whether for me it was political science, or maybe you like biology or whatever, just learn something. Um, and then if you want to be a journalist, maybe you want to do a grad school diploma or do some internships and find out if that's something that you want to do. Um, for me, what I really found uh, beneficial was I did as many internships. I loved, I never wanted to be a reporter. I wasn't involved uh, with the press at McGill at all. We had two daily, uh, they weren't daily at the time, but one was called the daily, it was not daily. And the Tribune, I was not involved in campus press. Um, but I loved CBC and I applied for a CBC internship and I got to work at CBC and radio through that. And then I really loved politics. So I applied for an internship on Parliament Hill. And the added benefit of sort of knowing where to go to get information that you learn on Parliament Hill that I learned when I worked at the United Nations, that stuff was invaluable. And although I did go to J school for a short while, uh, when CDC was locked out, I did a master's degree or started a master's degree. Um, I think it's important to know uh, information, like especially um, background in law so you don't get sued. Um, but <laughs> journalism is still something that you can learn, I believe, on the ground if you have wonderful mentors to teach you. And I would strongly encourage you to get a degree in something that you like. And that way, perhaps, you know, if you decide that journalism is not what you want to do or teaching is not what you want to do, that you have learned something. And it gives you a chance to experience a whole different uh, other professions as well or just background that is yes. very useful. Merci beaucoup pour la réponse. Une autre question dans l'audience ici. Hi, I'm Michaela from Smithers, BC. Um, you guys are saying you get information from the internet, right? But what happens if some countries put false information on the internet? We'll ask Mr. Mr. Rubin. But... Um, I, th I, think it's, I think it's essential to verify your sources. I mean, there are certain things you can do to think, think about the credibility of the sources that you're getting. So, if it's coming from a university or a respected news organization, that at least is one point. Um, if you find it in three different places, three different credible places corroborated, that's another place where you can assume that it might be more credible. I think it's also really critical to have a healthy do dose of skepticism in any information you find online. Wikipedia, for example. I feel similarly about Wikipedia. It's a great starting point, but I would never stop there, ever. Can I just add something? Well, yes, yeah, sure. I thought I'd take advantage of you not being up here. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I'm not, actually, I, uh, I'm, I think it's important to walk away from here with news you can use. And what, and I think that's a very pertinent question about what you should do if you're considering a career in journalism, because you're all here studying media awareness. And I would agree with you, actually. I think you do need a degree in something else. In my day, so to speak, we had, there was a one-year graduate degree, which we could take after a four-year degree in something else. Um, literature, history, politics, economics, increasingly important, mm -hmm. science, which is an expanding field. But beyond that, you have to read. You have to read. You have to read broadly. And you have to write. You have to write and you have to speak. And all those things we do try and encourage in the School of Journalism, but it is not the only way. Practical experience matters, but the idea is a good one that you need a broad-based, I would call liberal arts education. Uh, by the way, also another language increasingly today. And maybe not necessarily French or English, but another language. 
Um, but I think the idea that um, people can swan into this um, uh, without any background, without having studied something or read something, um, worries me. And I think that really it's important that reading and writing endlessly is what really what will make, I think, um, a, a good journalist. Thank you. Uh, another question from the audience. Thank you. My name is Tassie Trenman. I'm a grade 11 student. I'm from Langley, BC. I have a specific question for Mr. Scott Rubin. Um, with the Iranian government picking out faces from a crowd of protesters, would YouTube School be to first protect their safety by taking the uh, videos down or um, keeping the freedom of expression? It's, it's an excellent question and the kind of thing we grapple with all the time. Um, in part, there is a scalability question, meaning we have so much content on the site. For us to know exactly how it's being used off the site, is it would be absolutely impossible for us to do that. Um, if we were to be, if we provide safeguards for people who feel like their safety might be jeopardized, whether it's Iran or here, I mean, anywhere in the world, you can or your relative can make a privacy you know, complaint and say, hey, my face is on there. I never gave anybody permission to put it on there, and we will take it down. But we can't go proactively see this stuff because it would be too broad of a sweep. Are you cutting costs too? As you do? Go to, uh, to put people to uh, uh, monitor what, what's coming in. No, it's not, it's not a, an economic question at all. It's a, it's, part of it is a personal question. We don't want to be free screen content, and part of it is it's impossible to free screen. 20 hours of video, and I'm guessing the 20 hours of video is going to pop up soon. So imagine that, that's in 60 days we get more content than the major three great major broadcast networks in the states would have put on in 60 years if they were broadcasting original content every minute of every day for 60 years. Before to go, thank you. Before to go to the next question, there's one question in French here, and it goes with the previous question. Euh, on, vous a, on vous a dit tout à l'heure que c'était plus intéressant si vous obteniez un diplôme que de ne pas le faire. Maintenant, la question qui nous vient ici en français, est-ce que les chances, et je vais m'adresser à Altia et Roger, est-ce que les chances de trouver un emploi en journalisme en sortant de l'université sont bonnes? C'est de plus en plus difficile, je, je dois dire, parce que les salles de nouvelles artistes leurs équipes euh, en faisant souvent un ou deux ou trois jobs avec une personne. Mais je pense que si vous avez des idées et si vous êtes curieux et euh, que vous euh, voulez euh, challenger euh, la vie et regarder, je pense que c'est euh, possible, mais c'est plus difficile. Mais maintenant, vous pouvez être euh, euh, vieux journaliste, euh, journaliste, euh, photographe, euh, et souvent tout ça c'est combiné. Alors, il faut que vous soyez entrepreneur. C'est euh, le mot que je devrais euh, utiliser. Entrepreneur et puis flexible. Si ça ne vous dérange pas de ne pas savoir si vous avez euh, du travail le jour au lendemain, euh, je sais qu'à Radio-Canada, CBC, c'est encore, euh, il y a beaucoup de pégistes. Il y a toujours euh, du nouveau monde euh, qui rentre. À chaque année que je retournais, il y avait, euh, on va dire, 20, 30 différents visages. Euh, parce que les gens qui sont là après un bout temps, après quatre ans, ils décident que peut-être que ça ne vaut pas la peine, puis qu'ils veulent un emploi plus stable, qu'ils veulent avoir une compte pension. Euh, qui décident de, de se retirer. Mais ceux qui sont euh, vraiment dévoués, puis ça ne leur dérange pas de ne pas savoir s'ils vont avoir ce travail dans six mois, euh, je pense que c'est encore euh, un emploi qui est bien. Je tiens à vous souligner qu'on a dépassé un, un peu le temps prévu, mais j'ai la bénédiction des organisateurs. Alors moi, je poursuis tant qu'on ne me dit pas d'arrêter avec une question encore une fois dans la salle. Hi, my name is Gloria Mossman. I'm from Maple Ridge, British Columbia. Um, I'm part of a very new and very passionate social justice class at Westview Secondary School, and I was wondering how media literacy could help in that field of social justice. So, do you address your question to one member of the panel in particular? No, anyone that could. Anyone has something to say about that? I always have something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, I think that media literacy, uh, the ability to discern truth from misinformation, the ability also to use these platforms to put forth a message, is critical to social justice. Without it, in Burma, we would never know what was happening. Um, we still don't know a lot of what's happening there. The reason that 
Turkey, China, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, all these other countries block us, is that there is some element of truth or social justice that frightens them. And so the more you can use the internet, find information, encourage others to upload information, uh, it, the more the world changes. I have, I have up here on the screen CitizenTube, which is a blog that we have at YouTube on how video changes the world. Um, I suggest you go there and take a look. Every day, a few, this is probably going to change in oh, just a few minutes when people wake up on the West Coast, and you'll see more videos coming up. Every day you'll see how it's changing, and much of this is focused on social justice issues. Thank you. Another question in the room here? I'm Allison from White Rock, British Columbia, and I was just curious how much uh, censorship is involved in journalism, and particularly on the internet. How do you decide what is inappropriate and what is not, still respecting uh, the freedom of expression? So I'll ask Mr. Uh, Ruben first for the internet, and Mr. Cohen maybe for newspaper and media. Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure if I'm understanding entirely the question. But are you asking how we decide what can stay up on our sites and what comes down? Okay. Um, so that's different from. I would. I would not call that censorship uh, as as much as having certain guidelines. So when YouTube was, was first started in 2005, um, and initially the, the two founders, Chad and Steve, were so excited that anybody was uploading a video that everything went up on the site. And after a short time, they realized that if they didn't start to create some guidelines, it would soon become either a, a porn site, or if not actual pornography, it would become a site with lots of girls in bikinis. And so they decided to create the first community guidelines. Um, we try with those community guidelines are always evolving. We try, as I said earlier, to respect local laws, but for the most part, it's just keeping off what we think is the, is the worst experience for our users. So no graphic violence, no animal abuse, no sexually explicit content. But for the most part, the rest of it, it's it's up there and you can find it. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say censorship is an overt problem in the newspaper business. I think it's a matter of taste. Um, there were years ago, and I, I suppose there are today, but less enforced guidelines on, on what was tasteful. For example, um, in a news column, um, if you quoted someone using an expletive, um, you have to have a note at the top of the story saying, expletive included here. Um, if that weren't there, uh, you could be in big trouble as an editor. Now, one of the ways standards have changed, where the word change, can, in my sense, um, can mean eroded, um, is that expletives routinely appear. Uh, in newspaper copy in places you wouldn't think they would. So uh, community standards, I guess, have changed. I don't think for the better necessarily, but they've changed. So, but censorship per se, um, I think you should understand that when you're writing for a newspaper, you are, um, you're writing for a corporation um, which has certain values. If, if you want the Marxist view in your story, every story, you're probably unlikely to get it into every story. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you are operating within certain general societal constraints, I think, in that. Mm -hmm. Roger, à Altia, sur le terrain, j'aimerais vous entendre en français là-dessus. Avez-vous, sentez-vous, même, je dirais, une pression d'écrire une histoire de telle façon ou de ne pas parler de certaines choses venant de la part de, de votre employeur ou de votre subconscient vous-même? Euh, je devrais dire que c'est rare. Et euh, le processus est fait que... Euh, Comment on dit fait en euh, évaluer, analyser. Évaluer, euh, quand on écrit nos textes, il y a toujours euh, des euh, journalistes seniors qui vont, euh, qui ont pas été, qui sont pas au courant de la nouvelle exactement des détails. Et ces gens-là, vu qu'ils voient ton texte frais et sans attache, peuvent euh, dire tout de suite si ça correspond euh, aux normes qui devraient être là. Alors c'est un peu fait euh, ordinaire, on dirait. Et c'est rare qu'il va y avoir une pression de ne pas utiliser certaines choses. On voit dans le domaine public. Qu'en est-il du domaine public, à dire? Plus privé, pardon. Euh, moi, je ne sens pas de pression euh, de mes employeurs. Euh, mais je veux dire que quand il y a une histoire de manière euh, in, qui est importante euh, à la famille québécoise, qui est mon employeur, euh, je porte attention de leur donner un coup de fil. Disons, euh, surtout à ce qui a rapport avec, c'est quoi c'est un en français, euh, en fait, le groupe qui euh, fait la régulation pour euh, les câbles et euh, les services de, 
de téléphone cellulaire. Euh, mon employeur a aussi une chaîne euh, de CTVA. Euh, et puis, c'est un dossier qui suit de tout à fait. Alors, comme on appelle, euh, je pense qu'un des, euh, des spendus, c'était euh, broadcast, je ne sais pas, là. Mais en tout cas, on, on appelle plusieurs parties qui ont un intérêt. Alors, euh, j'appelle souvent Québécois pour savoir c'est quoi leur point de vue, puisque j'écris pour leurs journaux. Mais je pense que c'est vraiment euh, le seul moment où est-ce qu'on prend vraiment attention à ce qui notre emploi. Merci beaucoup. Question dans la salle? I am uh, Zachariah Hook from Cameras, Alberta, and my question is that in the global media and what's going on in our world, people like to know what the truth is, and I think that there's an ultimate truth behind every story, that there's one way how it goes, one way it ends up, but along with that, truth is a perspective, not only told through the journalist or the angle you take a shot when you're filming or something like that. So how do you, as workers in the global media, um, help get that ultimate truth out to the world? Maybe I could give an example. What happened recently with that kid that was supposed to be in a balloon? It starts with uh, news that's not true, but look at what happened with YouTube and the media, and everybody went with that news. Sometimes it's a news like that that doesn't have much impact, but it could have a big and serious impact. So maybe that will help you to, to answer that question. What do you mean? Well, uh, I'll say about uh, the way we shoot. Uh, we shoot uh, a story, a news story, uh, like from the front. It's the best example I can say. You can go on the side and get some different angles and, and uh, get some close-up to cut out information outside. Already there, you're, you're framing the information. Uh, but it's really hard to to show something who's not there. What? So it, it's hard to... Uh, it doesn't really happen. You, you can give a direction to, to an angle, but that's about it. And you cannot go that far with it because the truth will come out. And as a reporter, if you ask the right question in, in the example of the, the little boy in the balloon, uh, the person hearing the young uh, child saying it didn't work as, as well as it was or like it was supposed to, well, a, a reporter was there to pick up this piece of information and ask the next question. And the next question brought another question, and the truth came out that they arranged the whole thing. And it could have been... Uh, if, if this little boy would have said anything, it could have been the story that uh, we lost it. the kid was hidden because he didn't want to get uh, his parents mad. But the truth come out eventually at the end. If you ask the right question and take the right shot. Have you feeling Mr. Uh, Ruben has something to say about it? Just a quick thing, because I'm speaking to journalists every day. And um, I know that there are some people who are in my field of communications who feel like journalists are their adversaries. I think the journalists are my best chance of making And so the more questions I ask, the more they push me, the more they challenge me, the better I do my job, and the more I can figure out what the truth is. So I'm grateful. I know there are people who really get upset when they're pushed. My favorite journalists are the ones who are the most challenging to me. Merci beaucoup. Question à la salle? Hi, uh, my name is uh, Dylan Story. I'm from Snooze, BC. And I had a question for uh, Mr. Uh, Cohen. Um, do you express concern with the uh, million or the tons of voices that you get in the current uh, media network with YouTube and Google and stuff like that, and uh, and how it can be misleading and uh, racist and stuff like that? But uh, how do you think it compares to uh, large media corporations like uh, Fox News or even, uh, in some cases, CBC, when it'll uh, skew the... Uh, camera angle to make an NDP campaign uh, rally seem larger than it actually is. I, 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 that's the first I heard that. I didn't know that, that you could do that. Um, I don't see uh, I don't see conspiracies everywhere. I, I think there is a. Uh, I, I'm no um, I have no brief for Fox News. I think they're they're biased in their coverage, and the Obama administration has obviously made that judgment because he won't talk to Fox News. Um, 
there is bias everywhere, and, and the question asked from the, the student from Camrose over is a very good one about truth. And, and I think those of us who are in this business um, subconsciously, or maybe consciously, think about truth all the time. Uh, my um, my sense is, after being in this business some time, is there are there is often more than one truth. Uh, the lesson I've learned is there are other truths, and those are not often reported. And yes, they can be missed by the so-called establishment media, like the Globe and Mail or the Toronto Star. Then, then much of what I see in the blogosphere or the sites that proliferate on the internet, many of them conspiracy without any kind of um, uh, um, sourcing. Um, but we all make mistakes, and there are mistakes made. I think the question asked is, who makes fewer? And who's more credible? And I think, by and large, I, I've never heard of the CBC trying to make an NDP rally look larger. That'd be pretty hard to do. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, <laughs> uh, it happens, I'm sure. I'm just the moderator, so I won't say anything. No question on the side ici. Um, my question is for Mr. Cohen as well. I'm Stephanie from Delta, BC. And my question is, do you think that the different views you get on the internet, the less censored, the less carefully picked through, might be a good thing because it brings people awareness that there are still people out there who think, think racist thoughts and it brings more awareness? Um. The argument, and that's Scott's, I think it's Scott's argument, that, that the more out there, the better. Um, I think the more out there, um, the harder it may be to find what is truth. Uh, if you have to cut through the thicket, the thick underbrush of, of falsehood, which is there, uh, I suppose you could say it's there and you don't have to look at it, but getting through to it, to what is a, a credible place, and maybe it's YouTube, and Google, and the New York Times, and and other, you know, there are one at Huffington Post. There's a lot of interesting, a lot of new media out there, which is tremendous. Um, I think finding it, so as much as, uh, many of you, I think, are here as um, future producers of information, but you're also, will always be consumers. And I think that what we have to do in the, in the education business is find better ways to equip you to be wise consumers and to find what is the truth out there, especially to determine it. Je me, me sens besoin de reposer la question en français à nos deux panélistes qui parlent français euh, et de relancer ça d'une autre façon. Euh, beaucoup plus de monde dans les médias, mais souvent moins de propriétaires. Vous avez abordé un peu les choses tout à l'heure, mais quand on travaille pour un journal, comment on peut critiquer une émission de télévision euh, qui est de la même compagnie d'une part? Et j'aimerais ça savoir si d'un autre côté, le fait qu'il y ait tant de monde, qu'il y ait tant de compétition, ça vous pousse à travailler plus rapidement, euh, peut-être tourner les coins ronds, si vous connaissez l'expression. Est-ce que vous la sentez, cette pression-là? Je commence avec vous, Altia. Non, pas du tout. Euh, Peut-être que c'est une réflexion de propriétaire, mais je n'ai jamais reçu un appel sur aucune histoire. Je n'ai jamais, jamais, jamais senti de pression pour euh, ne pas couvrir une histoire ou de couvrir une histoire avec un angle particulier. Euh, quand j'ai donné l'exemple de Québécois avec euh, ce qui a rapport avec, euh, avec euh, les médias, c'est vraiment... Euh, un côté personnel de leur donner euh, cette plateforme-là, mais je n'ai jamais eu de note me disant euh, on veut parler à ce sujet X ou Y. Parfait. On va rapidement. On va, on va prendre une ah, dernière question ensuite. C'est la même chose à Radio-Canada ou à CBC. Euh, même quand ça nous concerne, nous, euh, internement, il euh, n'y a jamais de patron qui nous font une ligne de conduite pour dire euh, ne demande pas cette question-là ou certaines choses. Surtout quand les coupures arrivent, c'est la meilleure raison que je pourrais donner. Euh, les patrons qui sont obligés de répondre aux questions pourquoi on a fait les coupures, il euh, n'y a pas d'agenda qui, qui demande qu'on soit pas trop difficile. Ou... Alors, on n'est on est pas embêté par nos patrons sur la couverture médiatique. Il s'agit d'être objectif, euh, précis et véridique. Après ça, euh, il n'y a, a pas aucune attache qui peut reprocher ce que tu écris ou ce que tu mets en œuvre. Merci beaucoup. Une toute dernière question, puis on va mettre un terme à ce panel. Déjà, on a dépassé beaucoup les temps prévus. Alors, une question dans la salle. 
I'm Maggie from Gander Newfoundland, and I was just wondering where several of you mentioned you worked in different parts of the journalism industry. Do you find varying degrees of censorship between the internet, newspapers, television, radio? And do you address the question to one member in particular? No. So who would like to answer that question? Hard question? Censorship is not, I think, made by the company. It's more uh, um, uh, something you don't want to see on air. Right? It, it's not supposed to be there. It's the first censorship, I think. Uh, but otherwise, it's not really radical right? for censorship. De toute façon, j'allais peut-être mettre un terme là-dessus en disant que... Alors, je parlais d'objectivité. Plusieurs vont vous dire que l'objectivité, c'est impossible à atteindre, c'est vrai. Moi, je pense que la plus grande qualité d'un journaliste lorsqu'on parle de son travail, c'est l'honnêteté, se rapprocher de l'honnêteté. Et quand on tente de se rapprocher de l'honnêteté, on ne peut pas manquer son coup. Peu importe les pressions qu'on subit, que ce soit du fait qu'il y a des vidéos sur YouTube, qu'il y a de l'information qui vient un peu partout, il faut toujours se rapprocher de l'honnêteté. On va mettre un terme sur ce panel. Moi, c'est ici que prend fin mon mandat. That's where my mandate is, uh, ends. But I'd like to congratulate not only the member of the panel because they have very, very interesting uh, words. They were very interesting in their answers. But if they were so interesting, it's because also of you, whether you were here or everywhere in the country, your questions were great. Thank you for participating to this event again. And congratulations to the members of the panel.